Welcome to the MEOG Global Markets Podcast. I'm your host, George McCalvis, and today I'm joined by Glenn Schultz, the head of agency mortgage prepayment modeling for MEOG. Today is Wednesday, February 14th. Welcome back to the podcast, Glenn. Hi, George. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Well, let's just jump into it. So January remittance data was released um, earlier in the month on February 6th. And uh, according to data, the aggregate prepayments as measured by Fannie Mae 30-year cohorts reported a negative 2.5% decline on a month-on-month basis mm-hmm. to, to 4.2 CPR. And 15-year prepays mm-hmm. actually went up by 0.7 to 5.4%. The surprise print was in Ginny May 2 30M pools, you know, which reported uh, a six CPR, up you know twenty one point two percent on a month on month basis. So, you know, what are your thoughts given like, all these kind of dynamics? Sure, yeah, uh, you know, on our last podcast, we we discussed the outlook for winter prepayment, and at that time, you know, I expressed a belief that winter prepayment would decline to between three and a half and four and a half CPR, and January prepayment came in at 4.2 CPR. So uh, that's pretty close to our midpoint. Uh, and at least uh, with respect to the winter seasonal and prepayment, things have, have really kind of played out as we thought, but there's still some points to consider. Well, the first point is um, observations made by a lot of the street analysts, you know, the prepayment at the bottom of the coupon stack and, and that's higher coupons had demonstrated higher month over month changes than the lower coupons. Uh, to me, this isn't surprising. It's it's more or less expected when you think about, you know, uh, lower coupons, especially say the two, two and a half and threes, you know, uh, experience in the lock-in effect. Um, so, I, you know, there, I don't think there's much to be made out of that. The second was a substantial month over month gain in the 30 year GDMA 2M pools. Um, plus 21%. So when you look at it from from that particular lens, uh, it looks like a lot. But, you know, again, that was largely driven by the VA cohorts. Um, and 6% CPR is uh, maybe it's a little bit faster than than kind of that turnover number that we would have expected out of Ginny May in the winter. Uh, but more or less, it's in, in line with our expectations. So... And I, I think at first blush, that looks a little bit surprising, but you know, when you think it through, eh, not so much. Got it. And so I guess over the course of 2023, you did discuss and mention turnover a great deal and the turnover would actually exceed market expectations. And so I guess, given all this, what are your thoughts on prepays going forward for 24? Yeah, so, um, you know, we like to... We'll look at a, at the data, particularly sort of the uh, evolution of, of S curves, if you will, um, through the lens of kind of quarter over quarter. That gives us a good way to kind of compare how prepayments are evolving, say, for, versus the past six months or versus the past year. Um, and of course, you know, we only have one data point, obviously, for the Q1 2024 uh, uh, S curve. So, you, know, you have to kind of take everything with a grain of salt at this point. But you know, when you look at the triple deep out of the money prepayment, um, that was noticeably lower uh, than Q1 2023 at this point. And then across the new, the moderate, and the season cohorts, uh, we saw the same thing. So so this does suggest that turnover may be slower in, in 2024 than than that which we observed in 2023. So that said, you know, we need to put in another two or three months, uh, obviously, before we can build out the, the Q124 S curves and really kind of conclude the magnitude of what we think turnover is going to be going forward. But, you know, as it stands now, maybe we, you know, we're going to slightly lower turnover in 2024. Uh, so really the, con- the, the question before us in the MBS market at this point uh, in my view, is will 2023 turnover expectations be realized in in 2024? Or are we going to get you know something a little bit softer? Thanks for that. And so I guess maybe let's press it a little bit further on the turnover question. You know, turnover prepayments, you know, as as it's, it's said, is driven by local, regional, housing market, uh, while 
refi refinancing prepayments is more about and related to the macro economy, mm -hmm. uh, more or less the level of rates and the wealth effect and, 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 and those sort of things. So first, is that a fair characterization in your mind? And if so, what do you uh, say about the housing market in general? Um, yeah, I see where you're going with this. And in and, and respect to the first question, yeah, I, I think your characterization of turnover and refinance is, is correct in, in terms of the way that, that I think people should think about them when you start thinking about sort of the broader, uh, the broader economy and the housing market. So, you know, now with respect to the second question, what does lower turnover imply for the housing market? Um, and and that that is, to be honest, somewhat you know convoluted. So let's kind of think this through. Um, my first premise is that slower relative turnover. So we're talking existing home sales, not you know construction, those types of things. You know, it's not really necessarily a negative for the housing market. So recall that turnover is really relocation, death, divorce. Um, you know, growing family, which would be upsizing, shrinking family, which would be downsizing. Uh, the demographics are, you know, well, relatively well known. And, and, you know, the way I think about relocation is that more or less correlated with an expanding economy. So in my view, focusing on the demographics, there is a dislocation with respect to um, uh, uh, the demographics in particular on upsizing and downsizing. So we have the following, uh, a limited inventory, modest repricing relative to original listing price. So, you know, we know people may list um, at 105% to try to get of their asking price to get 100 or whatnot. Um, so, you know, we see this conundrum in the home prices now beginning to play out, uh, which is pricing is not only overall housing supply relative to population, but supply for sale relative to demand. So uh, it's, it's, it's a subtle difference, but I think it's an important difference. So when you start to think about it this way, you start to see that this is in turn beginning to drive home price appreciation. That is the supply relative to the overall demand and supply meaning what's on market for sale. And that's gonna turn around uh, and drive home price appreciation when these two things are out of balance. Uh, and that can, and I believe we're at the point where it begins to produce a negative feedback loop with respect to turnover, meaning, you know, you have higher home price appreciation, more people get priced out, you know, those types of things. Um, so so I do think that there's potential for this negative food feedback loop to, to occur. Wow, there's a lot to back on that one. Uh, let's just try to kind of go over some of that to, to summarize for our listeners. So your point really is that the dislocation in demographics is contributing to a strong home price appreciation, which in turn then reduces overall affordability as affordability decline, turnover related to prepayments decline with it. And this kind of really just kind of creates that feedback loop that you're referring to or the negative feedback loop and really adds to the, the, uh, unaffordability or you know, that's been happening or the affordability issue broadly in the U.S. Yeah, right. I mean, it it, it, it is a bit of a, a, a conundrum because when you begin to think about it and, and look at it through that lens, you know, what, what happens is lack of supply on the market against the demand uh, increases affordability, affordability, you know, decreases the turnover rate, right? So as you get less and less affordable. So, you know, home price appreciation also, you need to think about it in terms of uh, what type of an economic series it is. And so people view it or they classify home price appreciation as a persistent economic series, meaning it is difficult to change the direction of the series absent very strong policy or uh, does that, that's designed to reverse that or you know, a policy mistake, obviously, which, you know, then there's the unintended consequence, right? Um, so we've lived through the policy mistakes. Um, and and I think in my view, many others view these as policy mistakes as well. And you know, we had quantitative easing, okay, sure. Uh, but then we had this prolonged zero lower bound of interest rates. Uh, and then, you know, as we went into the pandemic, we had very, 
very you know strong asset purchase program that was you know really targeted towards agency MBS and and I think that's caused some some problems for the Federal Reserve on a go forward basis uh, because you know basically mortgages are a death pledge right so uh, the Fed is going to be holding their mortgages for a very long time and and then I think the theme going forward is the U.S. has sufficient housing for its population. The problem is that more people desire single family detached housing than that which is available and affordable. So what happens is this turns around and plays into shelter inflation, uh, which then turns around, you know, a single family uh, detached shelter inflation, let's say, can play into rent because there's got to be an equivalency there, right? Uh, and then by extension, this begins to move into uh, general inflation and then, you know, into interest rate policy. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I don't think the Fed can do much about home prices through interest rate policy, but, you know, we'll see if that plays into it. Um, but this starts to take us into the shores of like macro analysis. And, you know, that's kind of much more sort of your wheelhouse, but but I can see where this is going to begin um, to 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 create some problems, uh, not not only in terms of inflation, but uh, you know, in terms of uh, just people saying I want single family detached housing, and you know I can't get it. So what's the policy response? That type of thing. No, there's a obviously a linkage as you're alluding to back to the higher level, bigger picture macro on inflation and Fed policy in general. And we we got a glimpse of that, you know, on the 13th, you know, yesterday, you know, the day before recording with the CPI release, which saw that, you know, that owner's equivalent rent that you were referring to, you know, tick, tick higher in a meaningful way and, and surprise the markets. Uh, so, the, I mean, it, there is obviously a consequence to this. And I think uh, some of the data sets are picking up on it. But, you know, beyond the short-term issue, and where we stand um, and housing and how that fits into it. You know, the, the affordability issue is going to be hard to solve, like you say, just through uh, you know, starving out credit and having higher rates for longer. That could create un unintended consequences somewhere else in the system, right? So to kind of use one policy mistake to fix another one or create another one potentially is not the best course of action. So I do think that it, it, it does create a challenge for overall rate policy. Uh, but I also feel like it depends on where we truly are in the business cycle. Uh, you know, and I think our readers and listeners know that we have a slightly out of consensus view that we don't believe that a soft landing is possible without additional stimulus and or the Fed cutting rates and steepening out the curve and getting the banks to lend and really create a sustainable backdrop for economic activity where we've been kind of going through the ebbs and flows of just a lot of liquidity and stimulus every so often. And that's kind of kept the economy bouncing off the guardrails and sometimes really growing super fast and then sometimes decelerating, not yet to the point of a, an outright recession, but you just don't know if there's a policy mistake in the future and if the Fed overstays. Um, so I, I do think that um, a lot of this will probably eventually play back into your, your, your prepayment speeds and do we get an actual you know, lower rate environment? Does that actually create a refi wave or not? And and just the standard things that um, impacts housing and mortgages, as you know. Um, so I feel like, look, for us, um, the macro um, higher inflation or sticky inflation, at least for now, does push back the start of the easing cycle. It's in that coupled with more hawkish Fed, Fed rhetoric of late is one of the reasons why we pushed back our initial cut time period. But my my general view still remains that if they don't cut and try to pad the, the landing, that it's going to get bumpy. And if they wait to see proof, it might be too late. And I think that's the, that's the real risk here. I don't think it's going to really impact the supply demand part of the housing market as much. But in a weird way, we talked about this before too, it could create price discovery from a different point of view. If if rates were to drop more meaningfully and people then want to move around the country for different reasons and they feel like now they can move and get a lower rate somewhere else, that could also create price discovery 
too. We, we've lived in a world of unintended consequences really since the pandemic. So you never know. You get the opposite if rates actually decline. You actually get more turnover. Who knows? <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, right? I, I, yeah. I mean, you know, maybe you pick up some more, you know, maybe you pick up some more turnover. But, you know, you, you, you made an interesting point here, right, which is like maybe if rates come down, economic activity expands, people relocate, you know, for jobs and things like that. And that's kind of a, a, a component of the turnover, right? Um, but, you know, you have, you have policies in various different states and things like that. So, you know, you can, you can see like in where I'm at in Illinois, I mean, it's like not a lot of, not a lot of home price appreciation compared to the other parts of the country. And that's, you know, that's just policy, property taxes, things like that. So, right. you know, you can imagine somebody saying, well, you know, I want to move for a better job, but, uh, you know, maybe, you know, since home prices, say, in Illinois have lagged behind those in Tennessee, for sure, um, you, you can't, you know, replace your current living possibly with uh, equivalent in Tennessee. So what's normally viewed as maybe a lower cost state when, when you look at it across housing, it's not. So, and then people also sort of have to make some decisions, right? How much is, how much is this job worth versus, you know, maybe less house and, and, and kind of starting that process over again of trading up and home price. So it, it is, it is very difficult. It, it comes from, you know, in, in my view, sort of excessive intervention into the housing market. I mean, we have to be realistic about this, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those are, government sponsored entities that are in conservatorship of the of the US Treasury. I doubt, you know, at this point they're ever going to come out. Government likes the income from them. Um, you know, then you have Ginnie Mae, which is a government corporation. So, you know, housing is something that that, you know, the government from a policy policy perspective should should somewhat be involved in and and and, you know, I'm not going to bash it because, you know, we've, it, it's had this a stellar record relative to, I would say, you know, various different policy schemes in other countries. You know, that being well, said, excessive, yeah. excessive, excessive intervention causes problems. Sure. Listen, this this has been a, we could probably take this on for another <laughs> hour if we wanted to. So, but I, I want to. Just you know, say you know, thanks for coming on, and this was an interesting conversation. Uh, we went from the more micro remittances all the way up to the macro, and kind of somewhere in between to wrap things up. So, um, really, kind of have you on, and uh, you know, this again was our MUFG's MBS Global Markets Podcast, our monthly edition. Uh, please, uh, for those uh, interested, can you please rate, review, and subscribe? Uh, on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And, and again, reach out to your MUFG sales reps for any further information. And uh, check back soon for more insights from the Global Markets Research Team.